Good morning. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council, and I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, October 20th, and ask the clerk to call the roll to verify that we do have a quorum. Council Member Vital. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Wansley. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Osman. Present. Council Member Payne. Present. Council Member Koski. Present. Council Member Shugtai. Present. Council Member Chavez. Present. Council Member Ellison. Here. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 13 members present. At the record reflect, we do have a quorum. Next, we have the adoption of our agenda. Colleagues, for the, uh, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. There are two amendments to the agenda. First, Councilmember Payne is requesting to add a notice of intent to amend the liquor and beer code related to licensing applications and procedures. And then we have a second uh, amendment offered by Councilmember Ellison to introduce an ordinance with uh, unanimous consent related to the target market program. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda with those amendments. So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. Um, next, uh, we have uh, the acceptance of minutes from our regular meeting on October 6th. I have a motion to accept those minutes. So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, uh, and those minutes have been accepted. Finally, we have the referral of petitions, communications, reports to the proper committees. May I have a motion for that, please? So moved. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. It carries. Those matters have been referred. The uh, next thing is, on our agenda is the reports of our standing committees. Um, the first report is the Business Inspection and Housing Committee, and it will be presented by the Chair, uh, Council Member Goodman. Good morning, Madam President, members of the Council. The Business, Housing, Inspections, and Zoning Committee is bringing nine items forward for approval this morning. Item number one is a license for Veli Deli. Item two is a license for France 44. Item three are the liquor license approvals, and item four are 62 license renewals. Item five are business license operating conditions for Wild Greg's Saloon. Item six are exclusive development rights for a property at 623 24th Avenue North and 23616 at Lindale Avenue North. Item number seven are the Met Council's um, pre-development grants. This is called Livable Communities, and this is accepting grants for a couple of housing projects. Item eight is the AUAR for the East Gateway development, and item number nine is uh, the joint city-county action in order to execute a MOU with Hennepin County, as well as transferring money to Avivo and transferring money from the city to the county for street outreach. With that, I'll move items one through nine for approval this morning. Councilmember so Goodman has moved that committee's report. Are there any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, 
and that report has been adopted. Next, we have the report from the Committee of the Whole, and that report will be presented by the Chair, Council Vice President Palmasano. Madam President, the Committee of the Whole brings one item forward today. That's the Omnibus Ordinance on Government Structure that has been the focus of our committee for the past 10 months. On behalf of the entire committee, I'm pleased to present this with a favorable recommendation for approval by the City Council. And I'd like to speak to that motion too, Madam President. Um, please. Thank you. Um, I noted in my comments at our public hearing on Tuesday that this ordinance represents a partnership between the mayor and the city council. As with all ordinances, these are the official acts of the city itself. They are not the acts of any one individual who happens to be serving in office at a given point in time. In the future, when our residents look back to this ordinance, they won't be identifying this ordinance with me or with any of us on the council or with our current mayor. These ordinances are the local laws of our city, and I think this ordinance in particular is so very important to the future of our community. This ordinance puts into place a new governing structure that our voters adopted in form. So the voters spoke. They wanted this new form of government, and we are responding to the voters' will by working collaboratively to implement this new structure. The mayor has said many times that the goal is to put in place an operating structure that is durable, one that can be adjusted based on future community needs. He said he wants an operating structure that is efficient, one that is effective, and one that ensures the equitable delivery of city services to everybody in our community. I agree those are worthy goals. One comment that stuck with me after our public hearing was whether or not the mayor could simply make changes without consulting the council. There was a suggestion that the council through this ordinance was giving away its power. So I reflected on that, and I sought out clarification from our professional staff. Actually, without this ordinance and any further changes in the future, it is true that the mayor could organize the administration however they please without involving the council. As long as the mayor abided by the city charter, they could restructure the city departments however it made sense to them. Or, In other words, if we left this as voters adopted last year, it would empower all future mayors to organize the city's administration however they felt best met the needs of the times. If we did that, it would restrict council's authority to confirming certain department head positions and approving budgets. To me, that would be giving away council power and eliminating important checks and balances. Instead, the mayor submitted his proposal to us so that we, the council, might exercise our legislative prerogative and codify this operating structure in the code. That means we get a say in how those departments are, are organized. We get to agree to the way that departments will report within the structure under the mayor's authority. And we still get to confirm the mayor's appointments and approve budget allocations. We still maintain the final authority for local laws and public policies. To me, this collaboration with the mayor actually puts additional checks and balances in place to help protect the role of the city council as the legislative body. I appreciate that this mayor followed this path and did not simply pursue an organizational structure that suited his own needs today. And I know that it was also noted on Tuesday that we anticipate amendments to the city charter to further implement this operating structure. Those future actions will further cement in place an operating structure that is known that is consistent, that ensures stability between elections, that provides professional administration by qualified experts that will serve our city, regardless of who happens to be the mayor or who happens to hold seats on the city council at some future point in time. So I welcome the chance to vote on this ordinance and I look forward to considering any amendments to the charter in the future so that we, the city council, can protect our core roles and responsibilities for enacting city laws and policies so that we can ensure there is a system of checks and balances in place to serve our communities and our constituents. I know that we don't all agree on the final version of this ordinance and that's okay. The purpose of democracy isn't unanimous agreement it's building consensus so that we all have input on shared decisions about how we want the government to serve us. I know that this process has been very long and drawn out. I also appreciate that Councilmember Koski talked about the education we've all gained by going through this process together. And I want to repeat my thanks to each of you for your contributions, your engagement, and your willingness to work on this together, 
even when we didn't always agree. I think the final product reflects the consensus of this body. I'm proud of these results and our shared work. So thank you, President Jenkins, and to all of my colleagues for your partnership on this government structure ordinance. Thank you, um, Council Vice President Palmasano. Uh, does any of my colleagues have any comments or uh, questions? And I see Council Members Wansley, Ellison, and Payne in queue. Thank you, uh, Chair Jenkins. Um, I've had some serious concerns about this package from the beginning. Um, I've worked with my colleagues and staff to try to improve the proposal every step of the way, but unfortunately, the pro proposal in front of us is not something I can support, and I'm gonna list out very clearly a couple of reasons why. The first one being question one has been fully implemented for a year. This new restructure directly undermines question one by intentionally blurring the lines of authority and responsibility of the legislative body. The mayor now makes policy recommendations and a new layer of unelected bureaucrats blur the lines of mayoral authority. This is an overreach of question one. Affirming a executive legislative structure does not mean surrendering the council's authority to advance the priorities of our residents. Number two, this new structure does not take racial equity seriously. We have the opportunity to prioritize anti-racism and equity in everything the city does, but instead the Department of Race, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging is being kept at arm's length from the city operations and the mayor's office. City, le city leadership had, has had a confirmed pattern and, and problem with racism, that's very clear. And an important example of this was the letter earlier signed this year by most department heads urging the council to confirm someone despite over 50 mostly black and brown city workers speaking out about the systemic racism in their department. And even in the last week since voting down the executive race and equity department, the city has violently displaced hundreds of mostly unhoused indigenous black and brown people. Our vote has also even signaled to the public outside of these walls um, that we're not serious about anti-racism, so much so that my council has been contacted by labor groups with the efforts to exempt city employees from a mandated anti-racist training because we've signaled that this is not a real priority at the city of Minneapolis. The third, structural changes are just a distraction if they don't come with the political will for solutions. The mayor asked the public for more authority under question one and question two, and the public voted and gave it to him. But he has not used that authority to address any of the urgent problems that's facing our city right now. Pick one, from housing, from environmental justice to transportation. In just 10 months, we've moved backwards instead of forward. So what makes us think th things are gonna be anything different? And number four, and most importantly, it's never been explained why this new government will help ordinary people. Most importantly, this government restructure comes with no plans for tracking success. It does not come with the definition of success. There has never been any metrics laid out be, before this body uh, with a clear exp explanation of what the goals will be. There is no plan. There are no metrics. There's no plan to even check in down the road to see where we're going or how things are. What does success look like? What does failure look like? Your guess is as good as mine. And yet, council will most likely be passing this today. But I will be voting against this proposal. And even with that, I still look forward to working with my colleagues to most importantly bring this restructure to voters in 2023 who should ultimately have the final say on this. Allison is next in queue. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to hop in queue, and, and first of all, I want to thank my uh, colleague, Councilmember Wansley. Uh, I'd say I, I, I have felt uh, in this process similar, similarly to how Councilmember Wansley ex has expressed. Uh, today, uh, I will be supporting the proposal um, as as amended, uh, and the reason is is a couple, and I don't need to be belabor this point, but uh, I do think that there are still big questions about how we're going to function within this new system. 
Um, it's new to all of us. It certainly has been in education. Um, and while I opposed question one, you know, and felt that that process was incredibly political, I think that the process of shaping this proposal because of the leadership of our clerk and because of the leadership of uh, Attorney Trammell, uh, I think has been um, at least significantly less political in this process. And I think that uh, they have in good faith shaped this, helped the council and the mayor to shape this policy. Um, and so I think in the interest of, uh, and while I haven't gotten everything that I've wanted to see in this proposal, uh, the truth is that uh, I don't know that there's a version of this proposal that would fully satisfy uh, the kind of local government that I would want to run um, or be a part of. Uh, that being said, uh, a lot of changes that I've wanted to see happen have happened in this proposal. Uh, and so kind of taking the good with the bad in that sense, uh, I'll be supporting this proposal today. Uh, and I've got commitments uh, from a number of my colleagues, from the mayor, uh, around making sure that we can uh, maintain the integrity of work like OVP. We've moved uh, OPI, I think, to its appropriate place within the institution. Uh, Councilmember Goodman is leading work on, in making sure that we have a pathway and have real answers for how we can address constituent services. These are all still outstanding questions, but uh, I do feel like these conversations have happened in good faith. And so that's why I'll be supporting the proposal today. And I want to thank all my colleagues for uh, the work that they've put in uh, in making this happen. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Next in queue is Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, this has been such a learning experience. Uh, you know, we went into this term uh, really trying to understand what the implication of question one passing was. Uh, I was a strong supporter of question two, and of course that didn't pass. And we all believed that we needed to change the charter to see the types of structural changes that we wanted to see when it came to our public safety systems. And, you know, even learning just, you know, in the last couple of days that we don't, we, we really don't need to change the charter to have the office of community safety. We're actually operating under an office of community safety right now today without a charter change, without this ordinance being passed. Um, and it's kind of just opened my eyes to the opportunity that's ahead of us. And to me, um, we're still very early in this new form of our government. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we continue, we need to continue to learn. And I think that this ordinance is actually presupposing some of those lessons right now. I, and, and we're also in this unique opportunity where us on this body are going to only be here for two years, potentially, because we have another election next year. And the mayor has four years to really kind of smooth out what the structure of this new government is. And I think that um, committing to this ordinance today is actually removing a lot of the flexibility that the mayor has um, currently. I think that what we ought to do is actually learn and grow together under this, this new form of government. Um, you know, we've obviously as a body have allocated resources for staffing up these executive offices that the mayor has requested. Um, I think we should continue supporting the mayor and exploring what the best way to structure and run the government is before we make these commitments on paper. So I, I've actually, from a perspective of um, a more flexible approach to this learning moment in our government, think that we should maybe not pass this today. So I'm going to be voting no today, but encouraged by the opportunities ahead of us. Thank you, Council Member uh, Payne. Next in queue is Councilmember Rainbill. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will be voting yes on this today. It's a very historic moment for this city. The voters have spoken loud and clear that they wanted a new form of government. We've all worked hard over the 10 months. And in particular, no one's worked harder than uh, Attorney Tr Trammell and Clerk Carl and their staff. So I want to thank you again publicly for all your hard work and thoughtful work. The mayor's office has been uh, exceptional to work with. We've all uh, uh, taken the time to understand how this will improve our city, and I look forward to voting yes on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I will note that we have been joined by Mayor Fry and um, offer an opportunity to speak if you are interested. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, and thank you, Council Members, for having me today and for all of your deliberation and consideration off of what is uh, an historic decision that we're presently going through. 
Uh, I'm going to save more extended comments for after the council meeting, but I wanted to take this opportunity both to set a, a tone as well as to thank you. Um, this is indeed an historic occasion, one that has been over 100 years in the making with about 17 failed attempts in getting to this point in time. And it gives us right now an opportunity, yes, to do things differently, but also set up a long-lasting and durable government for multiple generations that is efficient, that is equitable, uh, that is inclusive and responsive to the needs of the residents of our city. Uh, there's no one right way of doing this. Uh, as we saw, the work group that we created immediately following the election came forward with several different recommendations. Uh, but all of those recommendations came within the context that the voters had just uh, submitted to us uh, a charge of an executive mayor and a legislative council. And so many people I want to thank in getting to this point, but a couple pieces I wanted to note. Um, we chose to get the council approval in this process. There were two ways of doing it, getting the council's approval and not getting the council's approval. Uh, the deliberations that you have undergone, I believe has made this a better ordinance. The work that you have done, the input that you have provided, uh, both through leadership of council president and council vice president through months and months of work, as well as through all of you. I've had extended conversations with most every one of you uh, about how best to structure a government. The input that you have provided, it has helped. And whether or not you agreed on question one, whether you were for it or you were against it, uh, your input enhances the democratic system. That's what our body, that's what our city enterprise should be about. Working with each other, deliberating, having disagreements, of course, and then finally coming to a consensus that quite simply makes people's lives better. You know, there's, there's some days where history happens to us. There's other days where we happen to history. I think this is one instance where it's the latter. We should be proud of it. Uh, I'm proud of you. I'm proud to work with you. Uh, and so thank you to all of the council members up here for their work on it. Also, uh, a few really special thank yous as well um, to our work group uh, that spent months deliberating on different forms of setting this structure up from a deputy mayor system to a chief administrative officer structure uh, to the system that we have in place, which offers an office of community safety. Uh, an area where I believe there is broad unity in integrating our response to the various safety issues we experience on the street, on the ground. Uh, thank you to Peter Ebnett uh, from my staff, uh, who has worked on this long and tirelessly, even far prior uh, to the election of last year, uh, to make sure that the pieces were in place in my office to ensure we could get this done and get it done right. Uh, to Susan Trammell, who drafted the ordinance before you to make sure that it worked and functioned legally, which is no small task given the charter and the code. Uh, and to, of course, uh, our city clerk, Casey Carl, um, who has such a deep understanding of our structure, whatever it may be, uh, and is always the one that makes sure that our figurative trains continue to roll here at City Hall. Uh, you know, this is, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some more extended comments later on after the council meeting so as not to uh, get in the way of the work that you all have before you, uh, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your work. I appreciate your support in getting to here. This is a, a, a major and proud day. Thank you, Mayor Fry. And I did put myself in queue uh, also to offer thanks to our staff, to uh, my colleagues who have all contributed uh, enormously to this process, each and every one of you, um, to the mayor and his staff, to the work group. This is a historic moment um, in the city of Minneapolis. I do have one question, I think, for uh, Ms. Trammell, and that, you know, we're 
you mentioned, Mayor Fry, that this is being done by ordinance um, with input from all of us. And I'm curious, are, are we able to um, amend or ship, shape this ordinance in the future before we go to the charter? Uh, President Jenkins. Good morning, Ms. Trammell. Good morning. Um, President Jenkins, members of the council, as with any ordinance, an ordinance may be amended by city council upon subject matter introduction and the regular processes of ordinance amendment. So uh, at any time in the future, should there be determined that the council wishes to amend the ordinance, it may be amended. And that would could be before or after a subsequent charter amendment. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't see any other of my colleagues in queue. And so I will now ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Vitoff. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Nay. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Nay. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Nay. Councilmember Chavez. Nay. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are nine ayes and four nays. That um, ordinance as well as that committee's report has been adopted. And um, we now have a new form of government in the city of Minneapolis. Um, next, we have the report from our policy and government oversight committee. That report will be presented by the chair, council member Ellison. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. The policy and government oversight committee is bringing forward 17 items uh, that is recommending for approval. Uh, one is the passage of a resolution for gift acceptance for donations to support the South Minneapolis Senior Fair event. Two is the passage of an ordinance for an appointed position in the Health Department, Deputy Commissioner of Health, Sustainability, Environment, and Healthy Homes. Three, accepting a bid for storm sewer inspection and televising. Four, accepting a bid for the Hoff Ramp Elevator Modernization Project. Five, accepting a bid for the Hoff Ramp Con condensing unit replacement. Six is accepting a contract with Versicon Inc. for fire station number eight, corrective maintenance and modernization project. Seven, authorizing contract with M Health Fairview for COVID-19 and influenza vaccination services. Eight is authorizing a contract amendment with the University of Minnesota Veterinary Medical Center for police canine health services. Nine is authorizing contract amendment with Roya Media LLC for communications and marketing services. 10 is authorizing contract amendment with the Vite and Company Inc. for Grand Avenue South Reconstruction Project. 11 is uh, authorizing a contract amendment with uh, a ASC Acquisition Company LLC for the Minneapolis Parking Ramp Sign Replacement Project. 12 is authorizing a contract amendment with Remix Software Inc. for providing a street design and transportation planning solution. Three is 13 is authorizing a contract amendment with Unger Boic Systems International Inc. for event activity software services for the Minneapolis Convention Center. 14 is approving a legal settlement, Laura DeShane versus the city of Minneapolis et al. 15 is approving a legal settlement, Deca Hussein versus the city of Minneapolis et al. And 16 is approving a legal settlement, Brenda Smith versus the city of Minneapolis et al. Lastly, 17 is authorizing contract with Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department for the Police Mental Health Embedded Social Worker Program and I will move approval of all these items. Councilmember Ellison has moved that committee's report. Are there any questions or comments? Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Jenkins. Um, I just have a comment about uh, item number 17. Um, I'm very glad that we're bringing social workers into the city's public safety team. However, it does not make sense that these social workers are just going to be located within MPD instead of the Office of Community Safety 
We just passed the government restructure. Um, and part of creating the Office of Community Safety uh, was to de-siloed our current uh, public safety system to make it more comprehensive. Yet these social workers who would be an incredible uh, and val valuable asset to every single division in OCS, um, they're being siloed to just one department, the police. Um, and that is very uh, much you know, in contradiction to the new public safety system that we just created. So for those reasons, I will be um, abstaining on item number 17. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wansley. I did put myself in queue to uh, just comment on item number one, the senior fair um, donation, and I've been working with Councilmember Koski uh, in planning this event for a number of months, and I think it's going to be a very informative and um, exciting event for seniors in our community. I believe the date is October 26th. And so I'm um, looking forward to, to that and encouraging my colleagues to support this, uh, adopting this uh, report today. Seeing no further comments, clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. I on everything except abstain on items number 17. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes on the report except for item number 17, which has 12 ayes and one abstention. That report is adopted. Uh, the next committee report is the Public Health and Safety Committee. That report will be presented by the Chair, Council Member Vital. The committee is bringing forward four items that it is recommending for approval. Item one is accepting a staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grant from FEMA for 15 additional firefighter positions. Item two is accepting a grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies for biochar production. Item three is authorizing a mutual aid agreement with Twin Cities jurisdictions for response in public health and environmental health emergencies. And item four is accepting a grant from the Office of Justice Programs to address the opioid epidemic through a hospital-based medication-assisted therapy program. I move for approval of these items. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Vital has moved the approval of this committee report. Is there any comments or questions? Any comments or questions? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Vital. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries the report as adopted. And finally, we have the report from our Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. That report will be presented by the Chair, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is bringing forward six items today. The first is the Special Service Districts 2023 <laughs> Proposed Services and Service Charges. The second and third are non-governmental tax-exempt parcel, both street maintenance and street light operation fees for 2023 in terms of assessments. Item number four is a partnership agreement with MnDOT for an outfall repair project at Taft Lake. Item number five is a grant application to uh, the Minnesota DNR for the 2023 State Park Road Account Program funding solicitation. And item number six is the Lowry Hills Special Service District second budget amendment. I will note for item one, this was sent forward without recommendation from the committee in order to have further engagement with the Dinky Town Association. And I was able to uh, connect with staff at the end of the day yesterday, and they were able to connect with that association and work out additional plans for helping resolve concerns. And so I want to extend my appreciation to staff for doing that. Uh, and as a result of that, I will be moving all six items uh, forward for approval today, and we'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Are there any questions? The Chair has moved the committee report. Are there any questions? 
Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next order of business is the notice of ordinance introductions. The first notice today is by Councilmember Johnson to amend the streets and sidewalk codes to amend language regarding the denial of and issuance of a right of way permits, standardizing fees for unpermitted work in the public right of way, and clarifying the permit denial appeal process. Next, uh, Councilmember Payne's notice of intent to amend the liquor and beer code to amend alcohol license applications provisions to clarify and consolidate processes. Those notices are hereby given. No further action is required at this time. Next, we have our introduction and referral calendar. First, pursuant to a notice by Councilmember Wansley, we will be introducing and giving first reading to the subject matter of an ordinance amending Title III of the Code related to air pollution and environmental protection to amend regulations related, relating to pollution control annual reg registration, which will be referred to the Public Health and Safety Committee in the next cycle. Second. Oh. I am sorry, I think we have some comments from Council Members Goodman and Wansley. Probably we each want to speak to our own introduction, so you can oh, Can I go first since my husband? Thank you, Council yes, Member Goodman. please. Thank you. Um, so my office um, is continuing to work with city staff and the community on this exciting change to um, our city's existing pollution control annual registration. There is so much energy and enthusiasm amongst thousands of working class people for classifying CO2 as a pollutant as a way to seriously incentivize lowering our carbon emissions and generate protected revenue to fund Green New Deal uh, programs. Uh, cities around the country are are leading the nation by significantly investing in green infrastructure and in environmental justice. Um, my residents have been consistent in asking the city to prioritize a local Green New Deal, and I look forward to working with them, external community groups, and city staff to make this a reality soon. So I just want to note that for our PCAR introduction. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley, and I um, am pleased that you brought this uh, uh, introduction forward and uh, look forward to working with you on it as well. Um, next, we have uh, Councilmember Goodman, who will be introducing with unanimous consent the subject matter of an ordinance amending Title 15 to the code related to offenses miscellaneous to add a new chapter, 405, relating to security of reproductive health care facilities to establish signage allowances and prohibit disrupting access to and occupying driveways of reproductive health care facilities, which will also be referred to the Public Health and Safety Committee in the next cycle. Councilmember Goodman, would you like to speak to I this? I would, thank you, Madam Chair. We're asking for unanimous consent today to move forward this um, ordinance change because persistent harassment of abortion clinics, escorts, and volunteers is too frequent in the city of Minneapolis. The National Abortion Federation's violence and disrupt disruption statistics show a 128% increase in incidences of assault and battery in 2001 alone. These incidents include reports of anti-abortion individuals pushing, shoving, using pepper spray against, slapping, kicking, and physically confronting clinic escorts, staff, and others outside of abortion facilities. This ordinance is meant to offer additional protections to abortion clinics. Let's just call it what it is. Abortion clinics, reproductive rights, care facilities in Minneapolis while still protecting people's First Amendment rights. Very simply put, this ordinance would prohibit the obstruction of driveways and other sidewalks, 
to get into parking lots and places where people seeking reproductive health care are looking to gain access. I will note that my office has been working on this for the better part of two months in partnership with Planned Parenthood. We also have been working with the ACLU to make sure that we protect everybody's First Amendment rights. Because of the ongoing threats of violence to abortion clinics and reproductive rights facilities in the city of Minneapolis, I'm asking for unanimous consent so we can move this ordinance, which is pretty much ready to go, to the Public Safety Committee for referral and to take it up as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman, for bringing forward this really important um, introduction. And last, we have Councilmember Ellison, who will be introducing, with unanimous consent, the subject matter of an ordinance amending Title II of the Code related to administration to amend the sunset provision and timing of the general industry category reviews which will be referred to the Policy and Government Oversight Committee in the next cycle. Uh, Councilmember Ellison, would you like to speak to this uh, yes. issue? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, this uh, is, speaks to the target market program. Um, I want to make we want to make sure that the program doesn't expire. Uh, I think that we all really appreciate the city's um, uh, uh, policy of doing business with our neighbors, and so. Um, uh, so yes, so I'll be taking a look at the sunset provision. I'll be working with staff to make sure that the program doesn't um, expire. Uh, and so that's all. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Again, a very important uh, ordinance to ensure that we are supporting um, small and people of color and women-owned businesses. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Councilmember Ellison. I actually, my entry point into the city was through the Target Market Program. So I think it just speaks to the success of that program. Excellent. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries those ordinances are referred to the committees in the next cycle as indicated on the agenda. Next, we have new business. And the first item is from Councilmember Chug Tai, who is bringing forward a staff directive related to a temporary pause of forced removals or closures of homeless encampments. Uh, Councilmember Chug Tai. Um, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I want to speak to the, uh, the first item that's before us under new business. Um, I'll start by providing some context. On June 29th of last year, the City Council received a presentation on homeless encampments, which emphasized that a comprehensive, clearly articulated policy and action plan must be implemented to address the complex and varied circumstances experienced by those residing outside. It also named that an established policy is the bedrock for a humane response to encampments. In June of this year, Councilmember Chavez and I brought forward notice of intent introducing policy related to encampment response. Since then, we've worked closely with the mayor's office and the administration on addressing this crisis. On October 6th, just a few weeks ago, three encampments were forcibly removed with a heavily armed police presence, resulting in unsheltered residents losing their belongings and the creation of new encampments and the growth of existing ones. The sort of conduct is unacceptable. It's clear that our stated intentions and the way residents experience our choices and actions are out of alignment with one another, making it impossible for people to gather their belongings with no advance notice, destroying people's belongings, including essential documentation, medication, and other important items, creates further displacements and, displacement and harm, Continued forced relocation will lead to more deaths in the middle of a pandemic and the looming winter months. 
The city of Minneapolis responds with inhumane tactics and does not systemically advance the reduction of homelessness and housing individuals in a dignified way. We should be striving for every resident in this city to be housed. That's not the reality of the world we live in, and a policy and action plan on homeless encampments that centers humanity, dignity, and safety is the least we can offer residents. Addressing homelessness and responding to unsheltered homelessness is absolutely something that we do in partnership with others, with the county, with the state, and with our nonprofit partners. But our present method of clearing encampments sets everyone backwards. The people who are experiencing homelessness lose what few possessions they have and are further traumatized. City staff and first responders are directed to leave their primary job responsibilities to give up days off while being understaffed. Their presence escalates tension and puts staff at unnecessary risk. And the work of our professional partners, like social workers, is made more difficult with the chaos that comes from clearing encampments without warning and partnership. The first part of this action that I'm bringing forward, temporarily pausing forced removals or closures of encampments uh, for the next six months through April 30th, 2023, addresses this. We need to stop this practice immediately and take time to reevaluate our approach and understand the impacts of our actions. I know this body to be one that values research, that values ensuring timely delivery of our city services for all of our constituents and ensuring that best practices are followed. The second part of this action addresses taking account for the full cost monetary, public health, and public safety of these forced removals. Encampment sweeps are costly with estimates that range as high as six figures per removal, and they take away funding and resources that could go to supporting our, our unhoused residents with basic services and needs and all residents with the critical city services um, that, that are required. It is incumbent upon us to be responsible stewards of our resources and to lead when our community is experiencing distress and conflict. And at minimum, we owe it to our taxpayers to be transparent about the cost of this practice. We need this information to make thoughtful decisions about the council's policymaking responsibility. Encampment residents, our constituents, service providers, um, our staff, all deserve clarity, transparency, and consistency in our decisions, and our constituents deserve transparency in how their money is being used. The response the city has had to, to, to homeless encampments is, is getting all of the wrong outcomes um, in, in safety and in the health of our communities, and we can't continue to operate under the same conditions, expecting different results each time. All of that being said, I'd like to move this item for approval and I'd like to divide the question to have separate votes on part A and part B so this body can make a decision on moving forward with a temporary pause and taking into account the full cost of, of these practices. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member Chuck Tai. Um, Council Member Chuck Tai has moved this uh, item under new business, a staff direction, and is requesting that we have separate votes on parts A and B. Is that accurate? Um, second. Is there a second? Second. So we have a motion and a proper second, and um, I see we have in queue, I think first council member Palmasano and next council member Wansley. Um, council member Palmasano. Wait, I'm sorry. Where in the queue do we see Palmasano or are you raising your? Above it, no. Oh, under new business, okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is my concern with both new business item one and item two, whether or not item is item one is split in two but is this staff directive within the council's authority under the city charter? That's a question for the city attorney. Um, council president, uh, council vice president, members of, of the council. Um, I, I and staff have, have taken a look at this and, and 
regardless of whether you, you split split A and B, this really goes to the the day-to-day -day enforcement of an ordinance that, that exists on the books. So that really is within the executive authority and not within the legislative authority. So then, Madam President, I see this as being out of order. It isn't consistent with our city charter, and I think we should move on to new business item three, actually, because new business items one and uh -huh. two are out of order. And if you disagree, we could take a vote on that as a consensus of no. this body. No. I think that um, we should take a council vote yes. on whether or not this is in order parliamentary procedure can i ask a question on parliamentary procedure before vote um yes uh council member johnson thank you madam president so i just wanted to check in more and actually ask a follow-up question with the city attorney on this so i see items a and items b uh, you know i can personally understand the concerns around executive authority, operational authority on item A, but for item B, does the charter not allow the council to gather information around city operations? I mean, I, I thought that's well within our purview. And so if we're asking for specific analysis to come back around costs, budget, which is also in the council's purview, I'm not quite sure how that would be in violation of the council's authority. So if I could get a further explanation, that would be great. At council President, um, Council Member Johnson, members of the council, um, the predicate of item B is, is during a temporary pause and so the temporary pause in, in A, again, is, is, is within that executive authority to, to administer and enforce existing ordinance. So there would be no problem with this if the words during the temporary pause was removed and it was basically directing staff to do that analysis and come back to council? Um, council member, uh, council president, council member Johnson, um, I think that the form being a directive is, is, is an issue if this was a request to staff. Uh, I think that the form, the form matters in terms of the day-to-day -day direction of the the the, um, the activities of staff being a directive. But again, a request would be something different. Is the request something then that we can force staff to come back with information? Because my understanding is that this body has authority to compel departments to provide information to this body. Is that, is that not the case? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, sorry, the clerk just handed the, the charter language to us. So um, the provision is, let's find the citation, 7.1H2, legislative oversight. The mayor, it says the mayor must furnish to the council any information that the council requests for the exercise of its legislative function, including but not limited to the budget. So the mayor must furnish to the council. So there is still, a, a, you know, all, all in, in terms of the city attorney's initial point and this point, um, where you're reaching a point that delves into enforcement. Enforcement is inherently mm -hmm. a series of discretionary decisions in the field often. Um, uh, and so, again, the, the implication of the charter, the way I read it, is that there, at some point there has to be a reach across the aisle from legislative to executive in order to effectuate um, ultimately something that would be um, um, operative and successful here. Thank you for the clarification. So if the council requests this information, the mayor must provide it. The administration must provide it. Yes, that, that, that's, okay, the way, that's, the, that's the way that's I read helpful. that. Yep, that's correct. Perfect. So it is well within again, our authority. Again, thank inf you. information only. It's, it, you know, you, the yes. steps beyond that obviously get you cross the line at some point. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> so just for my own clarification and I think for the audience as well, um, the council can request the mayor to provide this information regarding cost, um, activities, et cetera. Is that accurate? Council president, yes, that's accurate. City attorney, thank you very much. Um, so 
we have um, a decision point whether we want to um, vote as a body to, um, I guess, confirm this request. I think we might need the author to change the language from staff direction to a request to the mayor. Um, and this, and that would be for the second part of this um, staff request. Yeah. Um, and I know we have a number of my colleagues in queue to speak, <coughs> but I'm not sure if they're going to speak to this issue or to the the impending the pending vote. But let's go ahead and um, just go and queue Councilmember Wansley, um, Chuck Ty, and then Osman. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to defer, at least give space for uh, Councilmember Chuck Ty to be able to respond around like how she would like to move forward with what's in front of us before I speak. So you are ceding your time? Well, you mentioned before we got into queue if the author would like to um, adjust their amendment. We didn't get space to hear from Councilmember Chuktai on that. So I just want that before we start queue. Thank you. Councilmember Chuktai. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, speaking first to um, the, the authority of, of council to receive <coughs> Um, information that we need in order to make decisions around the budget and make policy decisions. This body in this term multiple times has passed staff directions that ask specific departments and specific staff um, and the administration to provide us with information that is time certain as it is in this case. So I would be happy to, to change the language of part B to by April 30th, 2023, the, you know, the mayor and, um, and relevant staff or the mayor and the administration or the mayor and the regulatory services department. Happy to make that change. But I, I think it's, it's really important, you know, every time we have discussions in this body about what the authority of this council is to, to do our jobs and to use taxpayer resources wisely and to write policy on behalf of residents that we see we see this administration use government structure as a trump card and it is not one in but in in the the request for council action on the the government structure ordinance that we just approved it states clearly that under this new government structure, the mayor is designated as the chief executive of the city government and the head of its administration, while the city council is the legislative body that has authority to enact local laws, to govern the community, and public policies to direct the delivery of city services and programs. This item, including the temporary pause, is about, direct, it's about that last piece included in that RCA. This is a piece of public policy directing the delivery of city services and programs. Can we get some further clarification on this? I think that's a question for the city attorney. Um, Chair Jenkins, uh, Count, Council Member Chuck Dye. Um, I don't know that there's anything new that needs to be said. I think our opinion still stands that um, the council does have the ability to request information. You obviously have the power of the purse and the legislative function of the city. And in order to inform those processes, you do need information. They're based on information. However, as the city attorney noted in part B, the, the initial clause is something that does go over that line between what is now a clear executive authority um, versus legislative authority.
Mr. Clerk, please, please, Mr. Clerk. Madam, Madam President, I was just going to try and maybe clear up. I think language is our problem here. We've always used the word staff directive, meaning requesting information. So to Council Member Shugtai's point, the, the title of the form of action, I think, is, is less problematic than as the attorneys have attempted to say. Part A is, is organizing and managing work. Part B is, as the attorneys have said, well within the legislative and policymaking uh, functions of the council, not to be disputed. The, the idea of a staff direction asking for this information is within the council's purview, so long as the intent of that directive is tied to the council's legislative policymaking and oversight functions, as long as it is adopted by the required vote, and as long as it's submitted to the mayor, and the mayor can veto or approve that, because it is an official act of the council. So I, I think possibly we're all learning and we're all adjusting under new language. A staff directive um, is not necessarily something a council cannot do. The staff directive is the thing we've been using. But I will say, as I've said before, the language can be confusing. You may remember back in February, staff was in front of this body uh, proposing a policy that we paused. And that policy was, as you'll recall, the request and referral process, where council members and council committees and the councils of body would follow a new policy on how to interact with the administration. It's unfortunate that in pursuing the government ordinance process, we, we put that aside and suspended work on it. That is something we need to bring forward, and I even believe other council members have mentioned this, that we need to have that consistent process, whereby, as the attorneys have said, the legislative body can reach across to the administration and get the information it needs, which the charter says you have the right to do. I don't think that, I don't want to speak for the attorneys, that part B on this staff direction um, is not within the council's purview. It is, and I think that you've been told, it is. Um, so uh, to, to settle that, this is within your purview. It is legislative in nature. It does support your policymaking functions, including current and potential future budgetary decisions. So I just want to sort of calm that down and say potentially the idea of staff direction. And when you combine them, that might be a different answer. You separated those. That creates two different issues. So I hope that I answered that perhaps a little more fully. I do think A potentially is problematic. I think B is within the council's role as the legislative body, and you have the right to request that. The way we've done that in the past is directing it to staff. I don't think that should have to change either. The mayor gets this action as soon as you're done with it. The mayor can make a decision to say no and return it to this body. So those checks and balances are maintained. I appreciate that clarification um, for, for me, for this body, for, for the room. Um, and so that being said, I would actually love some clarification from our attorneys on part A and speaking specifically to the, the council being the legislative body with the authority to enact public policies to direct the delivery of city services and programs. And when this item says, uh, when Part A says temporarily pausing force removals or closures of, of homeless encampments, um, the, the city's role in that is by using city services um, and programs to do so. So the, if the council has the authority to direct city services and programs, then this feels like it falls within that that explicit authority. Chair Jenkins, Council Member Trecht, I all attempt to answer. The, the, um, the, the, the only thing that is operative from a legislative perspective in this realm is the one provision in 244.60, I believe. That is a prohibition on temp the erection of temporary outdoor shelter. Um, the council can amend that ordinance it can it repeal it can repeal that ordinance <clears throat> you could add just thinking you could add you know craft carefully worded exceptions to that ordinance in terms of carrying that out any further that gets into the operative realm of the administration and the council doesn't have the authority to dictate how when why but you can set the guardrails that's all part of that legislative authority so that provision is on the books um, again as an existing provision um, essentially 
dictating a suspension, a staff suspension of operations, in my view, crosses that line into the executive realm. Thank you. So at this point, and Council Member Chuck Tai has separated these two items out, um, we can take up each item separately. Um, and then there is another issue of, so I think we have went through the process to determine what is the council's purview versus the executive purview. Um, and so now we will hear from council members. Did, council Member Wansley, did you remove yourself from Q? Um, council Member Wansley, Osmond, Johnson, and Ellison. Uh, Councilman Wansley. Thank you so much, Madam uh, President. First, I just want to extend a huge heartfelt thank you to uh, Council Member Chuck Ty for bringing this forward, even though there's efforts to try to stop us from just taking a vote on something that our residents are asking us to do and have been asking us to do for quite some time. I am very much aware that this has been a key issue uh, for many of us that we've been trying to move forward literally since our very first week. I know there was five of us that went to the near north and came in back in January with another uh, unjustified unju eviction was being planned uh, to be carried out. And ever since we went to that eviction, we've been met with resistance and misdirection from departments across the enterprise. Um, and that's very unfortunate that we keep relying on violently displacing our unhoused residents and still provide no thoughtful plan. We've been told time and time again from the executive plan, I mean, executive branch, that there was thoughtful action being taken, that there was a policy that was being guided. That is not true. We are not acting on any ordinance language or policy around encampment responses that has not went through this body. It's literally being made up as we go. And it seems like that's a pattern with this council where we selectively enforce when we can do our jobs or not. So now the council literally has the opportunity to say enough is enough and that we are not going to continue this cruel practice that is grounded in no evidence and that's not actually reducing homelessness. This proposal that I want to thank for my, you know, extend major thanks to my colleagues around, it's also realistic. It does not wave a magic wand and fix homelessness, but it does allow our city to finally take a commitment to stopping this current wasteful and inhumane practice. It shows that we are stopping our failed approach and getting serious about developing something different. And I really want to thank Again, Council Member Chuck Ty, um, for bringing this forward. Thank you to our residents, both housed and unhoused, who've had to continue to hold us accountable to do our jobs. And even up until this moment where we can literally take a vote to do something about it, we're still trying to figure out a workaround on it. So I would ask that we just take the vote. And if you have a problem with taking a no vote or a yes vote for it, that's a personal issue. Don't use procedure as a way to deflect from your responsibility to our residents. Council Member Osmond. No. <laughs> um, um, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam President. I, I am supportive of uh, Part B, requesting the mayor uh, information, and um, I think uh, also is tracking that uh, during the temporary pass. I do want to make comments on, on uh, homeless encampment in our city. Uh, our city, as I said it before, is uh, segregated. Not every homeless encampment affects every area in the city of Minneapolis. My ward is impacted uh, homeless encampments more than any, any, anywhere else in the city. When I took office, I had over a dozen, uh, uh, over 12 encampments uh, during that um, governor's uh, moratorium to stop evicting um, and, uh, homeless uh, folks. I have lived across the street from encampment over, for over a year. Um, uh, winter's coming up and these folks are dealing with so many issues. Um, mental health, homelessness. Um, there are 
in danger even where they're staying. It's not safe. We have deaths that are taking place in the encampments. We have shootings. We have in my district, in my area, we had a, uh, shootings. We had a baby that uh, died in the encampments. We deal with uh, so many, um, uh, so many uh, folks are being mistreated in those things. The folks that are coming outside that don't live in the encampments, the residents that live in the encampments are being exposed and sex trafficked. Um, uh, they're not in a safe environment. And also, also let's think about the residents that live in there too. Most of these encampments are located next to a low-income housing. A families that are one month away from paying their rent and themselves becoming a homelessness. And we just have to be fair in this process and really say it that our city is segregated. We are the ones, the poor people are the ones that are dealing with the encampments. These folks need help, as much help as we can as city leadership. This is a call for the leadership, especially the mayor's leadership, just not to be quiet about this and also uh, take the lead on this. Obviously, the city attorney told us that this is your area. We want to make sure that you are reaching out to the governor, you are reaching out to our state to dealing with the crisis we have in our city. You know, uh, I've been had a conversation, people talking about, let's have a designated areas in the encampments. But what part? You know, what part of the city do we take that at designated areas? The folks do need help. They are homeless. They are dealing with um, disabilities and, and, and mental health and so many crises here. And evicting them, it's not doing them any favor. But at the same time, also keeping a dangerous uh, uh, encampment next to a low-income housing and I'm not saying the folks that live in, in, in the area are dangerous, but there are folks that are coming in with guns, with drugs. You know, there's no oversight of, uh, you know, is the public works staff going to go there and clean up the needles and, and, and sanitary and all those stuff? We as a city have to take that lead. We can argue, you know, how operational we can work, but I, I think this requires a lot of uh, leadership, especially in the mayor's side to address this in a state crisis, not just a city issue, but this is a, a issue. These are folks need a lot of help. At the same time, we also want to keep the folks that are housed, housed. Um, I have dealt with many residents that are reaching out to me, you know, that were next to a, a dangerous encampment, as I, as I called it. And Elliott Park, we had a proponent explosion that happened there. Um, you know, uh, folks are dealing with expensive of, of their belongings that, that are being broken, their cars, like the next to the, like I say, low-income housing. Um, and now, you know, there's $600 expensive for, to, to fix their window. You know, and now they can't, they can't pay their rent. And I would say that, are we really doing any favor for the low-income housing uh, folks or the poor people that live in Ward 6 or Ward 9 or Ward 5 or so on? We're not doing any favors by uh, that. So I, I, I would just call out, this requires a lot of leadership and coming together and working together and coming up uh, and asking help for the state too, I would, I, I would ask, addressing this issue. Uh, and I'll, I'll close it out that the unhoused, or our unhoused residents deserve respect and dignity and they should be protected and we should also protect our residents uh, that live already in the areas that are dealing with uh, what comes with having encampments next to your house. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next is Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, I had I had two basic questions, um, uh, and I don't want to keep going into the semantics, but for for item A. Um, you know, a temporary pause. I mean, if, if, if we, I mean, that, how is that different than, uh, and this is for the attorneys, cause I think that it's the language maybe doesn't matter, but for my own understanding, 
you know, how does that different than um, a moratorium? Is the council no longer allowed to in, uh, impose moratoriums? You know, I think about other terms that have similar meetings. You know, it takes an act of Congress to uh, to you know put up an embargo or remove an embargo. It takes an act of Congress to you know create a prohibition or remove a prohibition. These are all things that are similar to moratoriums, and so is 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 it, it feels like a moratorium, a stay. Uh, a prohibition, an embargo, is legislative. It, uh, it feels policy in nature, and so I'm trying to understand how question A could be interpreted as out of order, uh, and if the attorneys could help uh, me understand that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Chair Jenkins, Councilmember Ellison, I'll attempt to. M moratorium is a specific defined legal term. Uh, it's a land use tool. It's authorized in the State Municipal Planning Act and then also in our zoning code. Um, it, it, it applies... Um, in a specific circumstance where there is a an active um, or authorized you know planning process going on in terms of our um, looking at our comprehensive plan and our implementing regulations the zoning code among uh, the primary among them um, that can freeze uh, you know certain permitting decisions uh, or, or certain types of development while that occurs so it's it's not really it's not really it's not relevant to this this realm the Again, the only code provision that bears on this issue on the books is a prohibition. It's a prohibition on temporary outdoor shelter with no other uh, context, per se, in the ordinance. So as the legislative body, yes, you could repeal that. You could craft exceptions. You could do those things. Um, but but in, terms of, in terms of just you know, asking for what it would be here, a suspension of enforcement. I view that as asking a stay of staff. That's an operational decision. I mean, they're, they, they are enforcing things that are on the books. That's what they do. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, uh, I also just wanted to say thank Councilmember Chiktai for, for bringing this forward. Um, I think often these conversations can be framed as whether you want encampments or don't want encampments uh but that sort of that binary is a little bit silly we're there are people who are living on the street there are people who are living in encampments and uh and us saying that you're not allowed to live in a tent you know uh, uh us enforcing an ordinance that was written i believe in 1960 uh probably not for this issue um isn't actually making it magically that people are not out on the streets or living in encampments or or you know congregate living out uh, uh, you know in fields or 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 parks, and so uh, I do think that we need a solution, and I don't think it should be taken as a uh, you know uh, uh, a chastising of staff for code enforcement to say uh, we need to we need to figure out how we're actually affecting the problem here or not affecting it. Um, uh, you know, my feeling is that, you know, when we remove an encampment and all we have now are uh, six, 12, 10 smaller encampments nearby in and around our neighborhoods, uh, which is often the case, um, that's not us getting closer to the problem. Yes, there are issues that arise in encampments and we need to be able to handle those. But I think what Councilmember Chuck Tai is proposing is that the solution that we've created is ex incredibly expensive. Uh, for anybody who was able to see some of the perimeters that were created uh, in these most recent closures, um, they lasted all day. Uh, they had, it must have been MPD working incredible numbers of overtime. Um, what, you know, I, I don't know that I've been briefed on the cost of that. I don't know the cost of that uh, uh, here as we speak. And so I think that requesting that information is, is really important. Uh, and so I want to thank Council Member Chuktai for this. I don't know if this is going to pass. I hope it does. I certainly know that the conversation won't be over, regardless of whether this passes or not, uh, because this issue, it continues. Um, and it really isn't a matter of whether you want or don't want encampments. It's a matter of, uh, are we affecting the problem or are we not? And how much money are we spending to not affect the problem? Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the other, the second question I had is, uh, given, given the changes in government structure, you know, I guess directive, um, uh, uh, request, uh, those are sort of semantics that are indistinguishable, but if the mayor doesn't, does not fulfill the request, um, and this passes, what, what, what is the council's recourse, um, 
then? Uh, what what are what's what is our sort of systems of accountability if a request goes um, unfulfilled? Is that is that a question for the city attorney? Yeah, I, yeah, it seems like a, a relevant legal question. Chair Chair Jenkins, Councilman Brillison, I might ask the clerk for assistance here, but I would assume this is like any official action of the council, regardless of the form, whether it's an ordinance, a resolution, or other, um, that it takes. Um, in most instances, seven votes to pass and advance it to the mayor. The mayor can sign it or veto it. And if it's vetoed, the council can override with nine votes. Um, and so I think the answer is still a question of um, voting capacity. Right. I guess my question was, if we get to nine and we get to the date certain, I thought there was a date certain on here, um, uh, and the request has still gone unfulfilled, sort of what is our recourse at that point? Um, and I'm asking literally because, you know, this is a new system of government. It's, it's, it's not, I don't think we've, it's not a situation we've ever been in before. Right, right. Um, Chair Jenkins, Councilman Rillison, it, uh, if the council overrided, it's an effective action and, and, you know, staff would have, staff would ha have to carry that out. Um, uh, I don't, it, it, it's hard to answer a question like that that presumes the worst possible outcome. I mean, it's, you know, you, would, you, you want to think that when voting happens and a vote like that, uh, a veto is overridden, that's, you know, staff are going to comply. I, I, I don't assume the opposite. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I hope that my colleagues are willing to support this at least um, uh, B, if not, if not A. Um, and, uh, and if and if A is inappropriate today, then I, I think that there's you know there still should be some conversations that happen uh, among council about um, uh, whether it be conversations with the mayor or amending um, uh, the 1960s ordinance um, to to give us some room uh, to create a, a kind of a, a pause, a moratorium, uh, an embargo on on these closures um, until we really know the, the the effect that they're having. So um, thank you. That's all. Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Allison. And next in queue is Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so I drafted up a motion under the anticipation that Councilmember Chuck Tai's pause wasn't going to be supported by this body. Um, I did not anticipate that there would be an attempt to just, you know, rule these out of order and not even have the opportunity to vote. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to say, uh, you know, I appreciate Council Member Chugtai, and I just want to share a little bit about why I drafted up my motion and what the contents of it are. So I, I simply want to make sure that, um, you know, as we're looking at our encampment closure process, we're, de we're, de we're determining an accurate, an accurate count of residents that are in each encampment, and that prior to enclosing those encampments, we, we can confirm that there's an actual bed available that can meet the needs of each of those residents, whether that's cultural, medical, religious, family, or otherwise. Um, I want there to be a notice to vacate on a certain date with a minimum of seven days. And I want folks to be able to add, store their belongings during that duration of time so that um, it doesn't get destroyed. And, you know, we described in our motion's background, which is on limbs, even if it's ruled out of order, it's on limbs for the public to read, um, that in August, the Reg Services Director provided city leadership uh, a high-level review of how the city responds to individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness and an overview of the city's encampment closure policies. Uh, later that month, a, a U.S. District Court judge ruled that a lawsuit brought on behalf of homeless people who lost their homes during encampment sweeps could continue against the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board. The judge allowed claims that the park board had unlawfully seized and destroyed the plaintiff's property in violation of their Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights and their state constitutional equivalents to move ahead. Encampment sweeps recently conducted by the city of Minneapolis compelled impacted community members and advocates to organize and share their stories of their experiences with how our current encampment closure policies have impacted their lives. Some of those folks are in the room today. Um, speakers at council committee meetings claim that the city, like the park board, may have violated the civil rights of some community members by unlawfully seizing and destroying their property in the process of executing encampment closures. Residents of encampments who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness are often disproportionately native, black, people of color, LGBTQ youth, 
or a combination of these identities, which means these policies disproportionately help or harm them. Following public feedback from impacted community members, the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing, which advises the city on issues related to housing included, um, passed a resolution urging this body and the mayor to limit and stop inhumane sweeps and evictions of encampments. What we have before us is a staff direction, um, whether it, you know, a moratorium or the staff direction that I'm proposing around some of these adjustments to how we approach these sweeps. Um, it, it doesn't stop encampment. Um, well, my, mine doesn't stop encampment evictions. Um, and, and I think Council Member Shugtai's spirit here is to say, let's just get this right before we do this. Um, and it's not gonna address all of the concerns regarding the city's encampment closure process, but if this body des uh, decides to forward it to, to the mayor for consideration, it could establish clearer timelines and ensure there are adequate shelter beds to accommodate residents of closing encampments, provide notice to council, and give access to storage for people's personal property. Um, as we've discussed in this pretty robust conversation, you know, the attorneys told me uh, that this is not within the purview of council um, and that to accomplish what I've laid out, I should, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one with the mayor's office. But at other times I've been told that council needs to move as a body and that we shouldn't be operating as individual council members trying to, you know, negotiate operational decisions at the staff level. Um, we've even received presentations and draft outlines on how the city council might eventually make council directives. Um, you know, and we even passed a new ordinance just today on that topic. Uh, and under that draft outline, uh, council can take formal action to give policy level direction, provide guidance, or establish expected outcomes or results on a particular issue or subject matter. Uh, is that not the same as a staff direction? And how must council directives be worded so it doesn't conflict with the charter? I mean, there's a lot of conversation about the language here. And I think putting aside the questions about this language, I'm really asking us to say, let's not get caught up in process or the legality of the specific language of the staff direction. Uh, instead, we need to consider the real question before us. Is a majority of this body willing to support common sense and humane policy towards encampments? If so, we can work together with our attorneys and clerks to find the correct language or way to work with the mayor and his administration to carry out our policy directives and perform our duty of setting policy as the legislative body of the city. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Payne. I can only speak for myself. I am absolutely 100% uh, in favor of trying to um, determine what would be a humane um, process for dealing with the unfortunate circumstance of um, encampments and unhoused uh, residents in our community. And what I'm hearing is that that process can be worked through with the full administration, with the mayor, and the city council, and we can do that, I do believe. Um, council Member Vital. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just don't even know where to start. I guess it feels like if this was done in the spirit of um, getting it right, it wouldn't have been sprung on us this morning. This is the first time I'm even seeing this language. And it feels performative. Like, if you really want to accomplish something, this isn't the way you get it done. If you want to really have solutions for our unhoused people, you work with your colleagues, you work with the mayor, you work with partners like Hennepin County, like the governor, all these solutions around housing. It really does. It, it feels extremely performative. This is an action that should come through a committee. We are in a full council meeting. Um, this could have come through any of our committees. My vice chair has just talked about, uh, you know, the work that he wants to do. This could have come through public health and safety. This could have come through POGO. This could have come through so many different community committees. That is 
the way things are done. It's a process. I don't like how some people want process and data for certain things, but not everything. This is an opportunity for us to get it right. This is not the time to perform, to play up to a group of people who come to threaten you and, and make you feel bad. Like, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen if we don't do it right. The right way is to work with our attorneys to make sure that we're not subjecting ourselves to things. I was on the park board when what um, council member um, Payne is talking about. I was at the park board when the lawsuit came. We, we got it wrong first. We had to go back and fix it. There's an opportunity to make sure that we're using the proper resources to get this right and put in language in front of us on Friday morning, uh, it's Thursday, it's Thursday, on Thursday morning at a meeting, it's not it. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um Thank you. Please, there is no, can we have one conversation, which is the city council conversation at this moment. Next in queue is council member Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. And before I get to my comments, I just want to take a moment just to bring up the decorum issue that continues to happen throughout this year. I mean, it is completely inappropriate. Uh, and we know this and it's part of our, our rules and our, our customs to uh, ascribe intentions and motives and to call people names on this body. Uh, it inflames and escalates discourse. And I would respectfully request the council leadership when that happens, immediately stop it and uh, call it out and help continue to ensure that this body is uh, working in a respectful way. We all have different opinions up here. That's the beauty of democracy. It's important for us all to share our perspectives and our opinions, but to do so in a way where we are not uh, ascribing motives to other people or calling e or reverting to calling each other names. I, uh, I certainly appreciate your comments, Mr. Johnson. I mean, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Council President. So. Uh, you know, I'm not sure which of these two items is before us, frankly, at this point. I'm kind of assuming both A and B are before us at this point, so I, I will speak to both of those. Uh, for item A, we've heard the opinions from city staff. Frankly, I agree with them that item A is operational. I also agree with uh, my colleagues' comments that uh, we should work to find a path. There are procedural paths available through our processes in order for this body to weigh in. And then the other aspect is even in the meantime, there is another elected uh, branch of our government 100 feet down the hall that, uh, that the public has, has an opportunity to reach out to as well. And council members, if we have interests in this, we can reach out to as well and work in partnership. As for item B, I think getting this information is something that is helpful and within the purview of the body, I would uh, maybe have a friendly suggestion on a potential additional amendment here. Uh, first off, the timeline is fairly significantly out there, April 30th. Uh, that may be able to be traded off with a piece that I have some concerns about, which is it specifically says in the last five years. That's a pretty lengthy amount of time. I'm not sure we're gonna have records uh, dating back that far of, you know, exactly how many people were used to remove an encampment, that sort of thing. So my suggestion might be to change that to something like the last year, and then you might be able to move the timeline up for when that report comes back to actually have it still happen within this year. So that might be a potential uh, amendment to consider. So I would like to express that as well uh, to the author. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Johnson. I think we have before us actually three items. One, I believe, has been addressed by the city attorney, whether or not Section A 
is appropriate for this body the way it is stated. The second item, and I think we would have to get some approval from the the author to either remove item A. And I'm, I'm looking in the chat and it looks like there has been a revised motion on item B. Um, it does not necessarily include the amendment that Council Member Johnson just offered. Um, but I'm not sure if you are interested in um, accepting that or not. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate the, the point that you're bringing up there, Council Member Johnson. It is something that um, I, I, I struggled with as well. And uh, this, this general request of, hey, staff, can you tell us how much this action cost is one um, that that we've uh, that I have made um, of staff in the past. I know Council Member Chavez has made of, of staff in the past, um, and uh, you know, in in specifically in speaking to the budget office, it was it was I was assured that the ability to look back at staff time that was billed and allocated for certain actions going back this amount of time was, was absolutely possible um, and something that they had the capacity to do. And then choosing five years as the number, I wanted to, I wanted to go back to the internal conversations that we have as, as, in, as a body around homelessness at times um, and hearing staff say, you know, this, this problem goes back to 2018 and the Well for Forgotten Natives and, and, and um, that that's where the city's approach on this issue started in, in this specific way. And I wanted to be as encompassing of that as possible. Um, and because that is a, a pretty significant request um, giving staff until the, the spring of next year, giving them the, the full six months to be able to come back to us with this information um, and, and having spoken with other bodies of, of, of government that we move this work with and other nonprofit partners that we move this work with and knowing that they have this data that we're asking for and that this request is um, within the, the scope of any person's ability in this city to fulfill um, is, is how I, I landed on this. And so... I think especially because it sounds like the will of this body um, is going to, to land in a place where we're, we're just going to be approving item B. I want us to be as holistic as possible in getting this information back, knowing that it does exist. Um, so I, I, I want us to just move forward with keeping item B as is and, and still, you know, uh, taking a, a, a vote on item A. I understand that our attorneys have expressed an opinion. I still think that um, this, this, uh, th that item A falls within a city policy to direct, uh, or a, a piece of public policy to direct city services. Um, and you may disagree with that. That's totally cool. You have the, the you, you get to make your choice about how you're gonna vote on this item for whatever reason you want to, to do that, so. Um, if we can just, if it's okay, if we can, you know, move forward to voting on these items. Thank you. Men has placed herself in queue. Councilmember Um Thank you, Madam President. I would suggest we call the question on item A. Um, I also would suggest that we refer all of the rest of this to a committee where it's clear that we could actually talk through all of these various requests for information, come to one motion that we would ask the mayor's off office for, and we can stop doing committee work in the council meeting right now. Uh, council Member Goodman has called the question. However, I want to just confirm with the clerk that I'm, I'm not sure how we deal with item A. Are we voting on whether it is 
in order? Or are we just voting it up and down? Madam President, it's my understanding that the motion was made uh, as a whole. The whole motion that was brought forward by Councilmember Shugtai was moved, and as part of moving, she then separated. That created the difference between what is A and what was originally presented as a dependent clause, B. They become separate motions. I turn to the city attorneys to confirm this position, but A has been deemed to be outside of the council, ultra-virus to the council's power. It's not within a legislative function. This is not a moratorium, as the assistant city attorney just explained. This is actually asking the executive staff not to do its job. So it would be outside the council's power. There wasn't a, a motion that I caught, which was to say, are we, is this in order or not? It was to vote on it. Um, voting on it is a, a bit awkward in that we would be voting on something your attorneys have already expressed publicly as outside of your power. Nevertheless, if council wishes to take that vote, certainly it can do so. Option B, or a second question, we're calling B, which I, with the council author's uh, approval, put into the chat for you to look at, attempts to take B and make it a more holistic motion. That's what's in front of the body right now, as I understand it. Council member, if I can be so bold as to go a step further outside what you asked. Mm -hmm. I did consult the attorneys. There are three uh, proposals here. All of them relate to the same subject. They're all asking for data, very important data. It's hard for us on the fly to capture that. Some of them are written in ways that are directory, directing departments to do something instead of requesting. I think there are ways that we could reword and put one big motion, which I was attempting to do, to take from the Shugtai Part B, the Payne and the Chavez motions and create one large directive that says, we want all of this data, we want um, reports in the meantime, and uh, we want the report back on the whole thing by the date that was given originally, April 30th, 2023. Um, can try and continue to make a more holistic motion that gets at all of that information, or do them piecemeal, and if they pass, it's the same result is voting on them all. Thank you for that clarity. And Point of so personal we have, privilege, uh, Madam President, I asked to call the question. Absolutely. That is on Thank the table. You, Council Member Goodman. So we have before us uh, Council Member Goodman call for the question. Um, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? That item carries, and we will now move to voting on Councilmember Chuck Ty's proposal, uh, first item A. <laughs> and um, now I see Councilmember Chavez and Q. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, Council President. I'm just going to wait for my separate motion. My staff direction is completely separate from the staff direction number one and staff direction number two. Thank you. Um, Council Member, are there any other comments? No, or when you call the question, that means take the vote. It doesn't mean not have more speakers. So the only vote, or the only question could be, are we voting on the chair's motion to s rule it out of order? Are we voting on Council Member Chugtai's motion to move it forward? I'm okay with either one. But someone in leadership should say what we're voting on. Once you call the question, that means there's no more discussion. We are voting on item number A that was proposed by Council Member Chuck Tai. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Rainville. No. Council Member Goodman. No. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. No. Council Member Osmond. No. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and eight nays. Ooh. Item A fails. The next item is item B, as proposed by Councilmember Chugtai. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Councilmember Goodman. No. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. 
President Jenkins. Aye. There are nine ayes and four nays. That item carries, and our next um, piece of business is a motion from Councilmember Payne. Councilmember Payne, would you like to speak to that motion? Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, as I said, all for the impacted parties. Uh, we've had a pretty robust discussion about this. Uh, I very much am interested in what the right way to say, to ask or request of the mayor uh, some of these policy provisions, but um, I'm happy to take a vote as written today and continue this collaboration going forward. Please. Um, we have a motion by council member um, Payne before us. And I see council vice president Palmasano and council member Rainville are in case. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, I agree with my colleagues that let's get this right. Let's improve how things are done here. Are we doing that today with these staff directions that we're trying to modify on the fly on the dais where many of us have not seen them until this morning? I don't think so. Um, most of the things in this motion, though surely not all of them, are, are done today in encampment clearings. That is my understanding. I know that to be true, in fact. Um, but I also believe that operationally, that this is operational and that this is out of order. So it's not that I'm it, to the decorum question, it's not that I am afraid of voting on something. It is that, um, excuse me. Um, it is that I think we need to come forward with one comprehensive way that will actually give us useful information instead of just constantly asking for more and more information, which takes away resources from working on improving this function. So I do believe this is out of order. I'd like a ruling from the attorney on whether or not this is out of order, and then it's up to the chair as to whether or not you want to still take a vote on it. I, I think we've already heard from the attorneys that, I mean, multiple times that it's operational and it is out of order. However, Council Member Payne has offered it, and I believe we should go ahead and take a vote on it. So, clerk, well, I'm sorry. Before we call the roll, council member Rain, Bill, and subsequently Wansley. <laughs> council member Rain, Bill has called the question which eliminates discussion. Uh, we can do that by a voice vote. All in favor, say indicate by saying aye. 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 Any oppose? Uh, that item carries, and uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on Councilmember Payne's amendment. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Councilmember Goodman. No. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. No. Councilmember Osmond. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and eight nays. That item fails. The next motion is being offered by Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. If the clerks can please add Councilmember Chuck Chai to the staff direction as we both worked on this together. This one is simple. I'm hopeful that this one will advance without an excuse to delay and help us with our policy making authority. I was at the Timberwolves game last night with the council president and we talked about how at the bare minimum we should be researching these studies to bring recommendations to this council. This staff direction is directing the Office of Performance and Innovation in the Race and Equity and Inclusion and Belonging Department. They will help us develop recommendations for non-police or minimal police involvement when an eviction of a homeless encampment occurs. They will consult with city department staff who carry out this work, community members, and they will analyze our current practices and include 
best practices moving forward on how to make sure that when an encampment is cleared, that it has as little police as possible, or to the extent possible, no police at all. There have been multiple encampment evictions in Ward 9 this year. The number one emails I received are how these evictions are conducted. Police officers themselves tell me they don't want to do it, especially during this police shortage. Our unhoused neighbors deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And I want to let you know the emails I get from my constituents. They tell me that they're on an eight by eight block radius of police officers with yellow tape, thinking that something horrible has happened. They deserve to know when this is happening, how it's happening, and we deserve to do it a different way. And I believe that in this body, we can do that. This is not controversial at all, or at least it shouldn't be. This is the core work of this body, to receive research and recommendations, and ultimately to develop policy. I expect to work with our city staff on this, the mayor's office, and others as we collaborate to find this different path forward. And yes, this timeline was in consultation with our staff. So if there isn't questions, it would be great to take a vote on this. Thank you, uh, Council Member um, Chavez. I see that we have in queue Council Member, several Council Members, starting with Council Vice President. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. I'm sorry, starting with Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to say thank you to Council Member Chavez for bringing this forward and also highlight, as you raised, that this is not an issue that we became aware of today, nor the actions that's been taken by Council Member Chuck Ty and you. This has been an ongoing conversation for many, many months. Um, so no one should be surprised that we're finally taking action on it. And that said, let's take action. I call the question um, and would love to support uh, Council Member Chavez's motion. Council Member um, Wansley has called the question. I, I know there are other colleagues who wanted to comment, but uh, by voice vote. Aye. All in Aye. favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item carries. And colleagues, in front of us, we have a motion by Council Member Chavez uh, directing the Office of Performance, Innovation, Race, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging to study, analyze, ridiculous um you have the motion in front of you um clerk please call the roll council member vita no council member rainville no council member goodman no council member wansley aye council member johnson aye council member osmond aye council member Payne. aye council member koski no Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are eight ayes and five nays. That item carries, and the next motion before us, um, that's it on our motions related to encampment. Ms. Uh, um, Madam President. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry? Oh, I, was, I got in queue at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Wansley. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, I just want to thank again my colleagues for helping us to stop at least playing whack-a-mole with people's lives. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing from our attorneys as an actual next step to address this issue around executive and legislative authority is around um, the current code of ordinance that allows um, basically or a prohibition on tents. So I would like to work with my colleagues, at least for the next uh, cycle, city council cycle on October 3rd, 2022, um, and introducing a notice of intent of repealing the Minneapolis code of ordinance title 12, chapter 244, article one, section 24460, temporary housing pro, uh, prohibited um, as a next step to make sure that we are able to just not center um, displacement um, and evictions as, again, the only solution to supporting our unhoused residents. And I look forward to working with my colleagues who understand that we need a humane approach to our unhoused community um, since we decide to not take that action up um, in a thoughtful way today. So I just wanted to note that for our future council member. Thank you, um, Council Member Wansley. And um, 
Colleagues, we do have a request for closed session today. Before we move to closed session, I'd like to take up any announcements. Do any of my colleagues have any announcements today? Do we have any announcements to make? <coughs> Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> wanted to make a brief announcement about elections, which I know might seem a little bit, uh, you know, given the <laughs> tense um, uh, discussion, really important discussion we've been having. But uh, elections are also important, and we we here at the city of Minneapolis we we run the, the elections within the city. Our our departments do, and they do a tremendous job. And so uh, I wanted to say there are just 19 days left until election day. And uh, according to the most recent reports, our election team has served uh, more than 28,000 Minneapolis residents. Uh, that's about 12% of all registered voters within the city of Minneapolis. Uh, that's 19 days before uh, we even hit election day. And so really proud of that work. Um, we know that elections matter. Uh, and this year is significant because of this is the most recent election after redistricting. That means every single um, uh, uh, state office is on the ballot. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's, that's, that's important. And so here in Minneapolis, you know, we do a phenomenal job. Uh, we make sure that we turn out the vote, but we can't take it for granted. And so I just want to thank the elections team again for all that they've done. Uh, and then uh, real quickly, I'll just say, you know, we, we've gone over this information before, but the Yearly Voter Center is in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, oh man, I had the address right in front of me, but I'm, 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 I've lost it. But Google the Yearly Vote Center and go there. I, that's my favorite place to vote. Um, and uh, it's open every weekday, um, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So folks get out there and vote. We've got 19 days left. Uh, I'll leave my comments there for now, um, but uh, just wanted to make sure folks know and that we keep this on our radar. Um, and, uh, and again, to thank our team at the Early Vote Center in the, in the Elections Department. And of course, uh, it's going to be a big um, production on Election Day. So uh, that's all, and thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Um, just for edification, Mr. Clerk, can you provide the address to the Early Vote Center? I believe it's 980 Hennepin Avenue East. Hennepin. East Hennepin Avenue. It's, it's 980 Hennepin on the east side. There you go. Thank you. With that, colleagues, we've called. We've, oh, more announcements. I'm sorry. Goodman and Wansley. You guys didn't say anything initially. Council Member Goodman. Wanted to just, just take a moment to celebrate the announcement this morning that the Minneapolis Foundation, along with LISC and Twin Cities Propel, is putting $10 million into redevelopment projects um, in the city of Minneapolis. If the chair will indulge me, I'd just like to read this list because it's a pretty big deal. The Aliveness Project to support the expansion and redesign of its existing building at 38th and Chicago. Ariza Retail Services to support the expansion of an additional auto service bay at a Lake Street business. Bluehorn Properties to support the renovation of 35,000 square feet of multi-tenant commercial space on Lake Street. The Chicago Area Fire Art Center to support the renovation, renovation of its uh, existing facility and new construction of a 500 square, square foot addition at 38th in Chicago. The Cultural Wellness Center to support the construction of 12,000 square feet for cultural healing career development and business incubation at 38th and Chicago. Eat Street Crossing to support the renovation of 16,000 square feet uh, of a food emporium on Lake Street. JDAT Food Group, yay for the north side, to support the construction of the Satori Lofts, which is a project that's underway right now on the north side. Jay Kinos for to support exterior and interior renovations to their existing building at 38th and Chicago. The John and Denise Graves Foundation to support the construction of Cali Lake Cultural Center's new affordable and market rate commercial space on Lake Street. Juxtaposition Arts to support the renovation and construction of 40,000 square feet of their new art center on West Broadway. Midtown Global Market to support the renovation of the global market on Lake Street. Newer Rules CBG to support the renovation of 25 Bell Lofts apartments as a housing prototype and innovative hub for culture and wellness along West Broadway. North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems to support a commercial kitchen space on the Lake Street corridor for indigenous kitchens and marketing for entrepreneurs. Project for Pride and Living to 
to support a new mixed use development with 110 units of affordable housing on Nicollet. Redesign Inc. to support the renovation of the Coliseum building into an affordable and market rate commercial space for 30 entrepreneurs who are black, indigenous, and people of color. The Riverfront Development Partners to support the construction of 20, 71 units of affordable housing and four commercial units owned by African American and women led businesses on West Broadway. Southside Community Health Services to support the construction of a federally qualified health center at 38th and Chicago. Urban Homeworks to support tenant improvements for their new office space on West Broadway. Waldo LLC to support the renovation of their exterior building at 38th and Chicago. And lastly, 1200 KMA development to support the redevelopment of 28,000 square feet, formerly known as 1220 West Broadway. This is a massive investment of private and public dollars going into 38th and Chicago, the Lake Street Corridor, as well as West Broadway. We are very grateful as city leaders to all of the partners who have stepped up to help us with our economic development goals. This is a very intentional focus on bringing back 38th and Chicago, Lake Street and West Broadway. I want to thank former Mayor Ryback as well as our partners at LISC and the good folks at Propel for Nonprofits for so deeply investing in parts of the city that could use the support the most. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. And yeah, I noticed that that um, email came in as we were deliberating in our council meeting and didn't have a chance to read it, but I am floored that um, minimum five of those projects are deeply impacting the the eighth ward with several others adjacent to the eighth ward. Um, I, I'm just incredibly floored at this moment and, and grateful for that. Opportunity, though, we know that there is significantly more investment that is needed and necessary in those corridors. I'm really uh, pleased to hear the investments that are happening along West Broadway as well. I think those are significant um, uh, public-private investments in um, helping our community recover from the devastating impacts of the murder of George Floyd as well as uh, the, the global pandemic. And I see next in queue is Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to uh, give major thanks to everyone who was part of the Municipal Snow and Ice Removal Study Session yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember um, and PWI Chair uh, Andrew Johnson, who's walked out, can give him his flowers now, but just wanted to give him also major thanks for pulling it together along with our public work staff. Uh, we have so many partners and residents in the room um, and we're able to have a productive uh, discussion about the historic and current state of snow removal um, especially since winter is coming, um, and to continue developing plans that will move us towards a program that ensures every single resident can move uh, safely uh, around our city all winter long. So I just wanted to give a major shout out um, to our public works team and council members for making that happen and look forward to the next steps. Thank you, uh, council member Wansley. And I guess just one more announcement before we um, close out. Um, I just learned that today is Councilmember Ellison's birthday. And so uh, I think a collective happy birthday is in order, young man. Wait, <laughs> Madam President, can I put an addendum to include uh, Council Member Chavez, who literally wanted to do his birthday in secret? So if we could add... Jason to this mix too and a happy okay. birthday song, that would be great. Yeah, I'm putting you on blast. I, I, would, <laughs> I would wholeheartedly support that and offer um, uh, happy birthday to you as well, Council <laughs> Member Chavez. I've heard this body sing happy birthday before oh, and I am going to uh, no, suggest that we do it. not yes, do that We got to practice, today. practice day to you. Oh, and there it goes. Happy birthday to, to Target you. Target my song. Happy birthday, dear Jeremiah and Jason. Happy birthday to you. 
appreciate it. I all right. Told, I told you, I told all you guys it was bad. <laughs> but, Jeremy, um, happy birthday. We have one more announcement. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have, happy, yeah, we can't I didn't keep have doing one, that boring happy. I did have one thing to we, say. We have one more announcement from <laughs> Councilmember Chapman. All the things that Councilmember Goodman said are, 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 are great, very great investments that are coming into our community. I also just want to thank Representative Noor. He carried that legislation at the state capitol. I actually was his legislative assistant throughout the entire process and served as a CLA for the committee that helped pass this. So it's just very amazing to see that this money is coming back into these important cultural corridors. It would be remiss to say that without his leadership, we also wouldn't be able to do it too. It, it takes a village. Thank you so much for that announcement. And um, with that, we've completed the regular items on our agenda and will now consider the request for a closed session which is for two litigation matters as listed on the agenda, Jamal Samaha Etel versus the city of Minneapolis. I'm sorry, et al. versus the city of Minneapolis and Nakima Levy-Armstrong et al. versus the city of Minneapolis et al. Before I move to close the meeting, I will recognize the city attorney to provide the legal basis for the requested closed session. President Jenkins, uh, council members, the next items on our agenda are the cases of Jamal Samaha et al. versus City of Minneapolis et al. and Nakima Levy Armstrong et al. versus City of Minneapolis et al. These cases are in active litigation in federal court. Your attorneys wish to discuss with the council litigation strategy and or settlement possibilities. Accordingly, under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Minnesota Statute Section 13D05, Subdivision 3B, the council may, upon a proper motion, close the meeting for the purposes of attorney-client communication. In considering the motion, the council should weigh the right of the public to know what the government is doing against the need of the city to preserve the confidentiality of its discussions with its attorneys. Thank you, um, Madam City Attorney. And with that, I move that our public meeting be closed as authorized under the provisions of the open meeting law, specifically Minnesota Statute Section 13D.05, Subdivision 3B, for the purpose of discussing the litigation matters of Jamal Sama et al. versus City of Minneapolis et al. and Nakima Levy Armstrong et al. v. City of Minneapolis et al. with the city attorney, may I have a second to that motion? Second. Uh, we have a proper motion and second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson is absent. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries. We will now close the public portion of our meeting and convene in closed session. For the viewing public, I will note that the broadcast of this meeting will continue and the council will reconvene in public after we have concluded the closed session. I will also note that Council Member Johnson left to um, attend a ward meeting in Ward 12. Thank you very much, and we will see you when we return.
The time is now 1233, and the City Council has reconvened in open session. Following our closed session, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Present. Member Payne. Present. Councilmember Costi. Present. Councilmember Shugtai. Present. Councilmember Chavez. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Present. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. We do have a quorum, and I will um, call on Council Vice President to bring forward a motion. Thank you, Madam President. I move that all claims, including claims for attorney's fees and costs asserted in Jamal Samaha et al. versus City of Minneapolis and in Nikima Levy Armstrong et al. versus City of Minneapolis et al. be settled in the amount of $50,000 to each named plaintiff for the total sum of $600,000 to plaintiffs and with the non-monetary considerations set forth in the settlement agreement and released between the parties. The payment shall be made out to their attorneys respectively, and the city attorney's office is authorized to execute and file any documents necessary to effectuate this settlement. Um, Council Vice President Palmasano has moved um, this item. Is there a second? Second. Uh, is there any discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Aye. Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson is absent. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That item carries. And with that, we have completed our business today. And with nothing further to come before the council and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>